I think that people think that our criminal justice system is designed to be punitive and that when folks are sent to prison or to jail that we don't really have to think about them anymore. The problem though is that 95% of the people who are sent to prison are released at some point. And so what they are released to, how, like, how successful they can be when it comes to employment or housing or licensing or education, public benefits, all of those things are so connected to their prior prison sentence that it makes it very likely that they would return. Uh, what we know in Georgia, for example, is one in three people return to prison within three years after being released. And that is because Georgia is one of the hardest states when it comes to finding a job with a criminal record, when it comes to finding housing with a criminal record. Um, and so, you know, my work um, and many advocates in Georgia who are centered on reentry are focused on what kind of opportunities are available to people when people return from prison and how can we change the stigma? How can we change the mindsets of people who don't really understand what it means to have a criminal record, what potential risks or liabilities actually exist and wh which are just more about the stigma or the lack of um, understanding about the criminal justice system? So I would say that, that our work is, is twofold. Um, one is education and outreach, or maybe even threefold. One is um, education and outreach, talking to people about the impact of a record, what the laws are on the books. There are hundreds of laws in Georgia dealing with um, keeping people from access to these kinds of opportunities. The other is litigation and individual representation, trying to actively hold employers and housing providers to the standards set by the law. There are ways in which criminal records and policies that discriminate on the basis of criminal records have disparate impacts on people of color. So there are already some federal laws that exist that help protect people from blanket discrimination when it comes to their records. So some of the work is just letting folks know what is available and representing folks who are um, coming up against those challenges. And then the third piece is what I do, which is to try to figure out a way to change the laws. Um, you know, working on criminal records laws, what can come off of your record after a particular time? Um, how do you deal with employers in terms of their um, risk of liability. They know that employers are concerned if they hire someone with a record, or whether or not they uh, will expose themselves to their own liability, to liability because of that. So trying to address some of those concerns. Thinking about public benefits, you know, food stamps. Georgia was a place where um, if you were convicted of a drug felony, um, you could never get food stamps again. So one of the things that um, I worked on was trying to eliminate that ban so that it makes people, it makes it easier for people to move on when they have a record. Um, so I'd say all those things, right? Uh, representation, education, and public policy change are the way that we're addressing reentry challenges in Georgia. So how would you define what the stigma is? I mean, or what kind of stigma people face? I mean. Um, so you think, um, you know, we are doing a lot of work with misdemeanor bail reform and thinking about pretrial justice, people who are held because they were charged with a crime but never convicted. And some of the, what we run into there is that people assume if you were arrested, you must have done something. If you have a record, you must have done something. And I think that there are lots of reasons that people plead guilty to things for which they did not do. Um, and if, our, if the point of our criminal justice system is to address crime, to deter crime, and to, and to improve our community, then we should look at people who go into the criminal justice system as need, as what, in terms of the most in need, and not the in, um, people that need the most punishment. Because what we know about people that are incarcerated is that uh, seven out of ten don't have a high school diploma or a GED. That very uh, most of them um, will live below the at or below the poverty line. That they are uh, don't have strong family units. That they um, ha you know may have come from areas devastated by um, economic um, d you know disparity and. Um, the recession and all kinds of things that just play into the impact that the system has. Um, we know that homelessness, right, some of our jails and prisons have a lot of people who didn't have homes on the outside. Um, so I say all that to say, when you think about stigma, when you think about what people think about people who go to prison, they 
are the people who are in the most need. So we should be thinking about what our prison system and our correction systems is doing to rehabilitate individuals, to give them opportunities to better themselves. So I think that the frame is that, that instead of thinking about ways we can be more putative, we should be thinking about the ways in which we can actually restore folks' lives and, make, and, and have thriving, strong, safe communities. And you also hear, of course, that the prison system discriminates most or incarcerates most African-American men. That's right. That's right. I mean, this this notion that our criminal justice system is the new slavery, the new, you know, having a criminal record is the new Jim Crow. Um, the way that our system has evolved uh, to not be as overtly racist, but to continue the institutional racism, um, that is definitely a part of, of this conversation. Uh, what we know, for example, in Georgia is that while African Americans are about 35% or so of the state's population, it's about 60% of the state's prison population. Uh, some of the recent reforms have been very good at dealing with race disparity. We are seeing less people, less African Americans go to prison now than um, before 1987. Um, so we are, we are the, the reforms we're doing are making the difference. But if you think about the likelihood of arrest, of being even stopped, searched, um, you know, charged, um, detained without bail, uh, sentenced to prison, all of those things are much more likely to occur for individuals who are um, people of color. And then oftentimes you hear about our prison system as our mental health system as well. That's right. And you know, DeKalb and Fulton County uh, kind of compete, if you will, for who is the largest provider of criminal of mental health services in the state. Um, it's an unfortunate reality that most of our jails across the state are have high populations of people with mental health issues, and that's because there aren't effective community-based treatment options for people in the in where they live. Um, and so, I had a mentor once tell me that when every other system fails. The criminal justice system is the net that catches you. So when you think about mental health treatment or effective behavioral health uh, in the community, if there isn't an opportunity for folks to get treated where they live, then someone is going to call the police on them and they are more than likely going to be incarcerated. Defendant shot and killed. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Which we've heard of. So uh, what is being done in the state of Georgia? What can be done? The Department of Corrections Institute, mm -hmm. you know, diploma, GED programs, yeah. et cetera. So Georgia has been um, a leader when it comes to criminal justice reform and thinking about re-entry in a systemic way. Um, the state has a, a developed a prisoner's re-entry initiative um, and started a pilot, several, pilot program several years ago, concentrating on the places in which people with criminal, that were uh, in which people were returning from prison and trying to develop some community-based opportunities for individuals with employers and licensing and um, housing providers and substance abuse treatment providers, trying to, again, do some in-reach, finding out what people need while they're in before they get out, uh, trying to build out transitional housing, thinking about mental health treatment in a different way. So the state is responding um, to the needs that people are having when they are re-entering. Uh, Georgia was the first state in the Deep South to pass Ban the Box or to Im implement Ban the Box policy when it comes to state employment. We have a Ban the Box policy for state licensing that is legislative that passed a few years ago. Um, we have a new department, the Department of Community Supervision, which is um, entirely committed to what it looks like for individuals who are on probation or on parole and what opportunities exist now for them to be successful. So I would say that Georgia is, is um, being intentional about it, but we still have quite a ways to go. Uh, I, I would say that a lot of work needs to be done on the point we raised earlier around stigma and private actors. Um, the state has done a great job in, remove, in addressing its way in which it discriminates against people with criminal records, but we have not done nearly enough to address what happens in private businesses and in private um, housing providers when they are coming across applications for which a person has checked a box that indicates they have something on their criminal record. And what we know is that most employers, regardless of whether or not the charge ended in a conviction, is likely to, to treat the application negatively, right? To, to think about the applicant as not being someone for which they could employ because they've said they had any kind of criminal record. Is there a role the faith community can play? Oh, ab say? absolutely, and they are. They are involved in this effort, but this is all about redemption. This is all about understanding that we are better than our worst day and that we shouldn't be defined by you know the worst thing that we've ever done. Um, and that, again, this, this point that 
even our system recognizes that a punishment isn't forever. 95% of people, again, are going to be released. So thinking about the, uh, how welcome we make individuals feel and if we desire that they should be a part of our community and live and thrive, then how, what is the role of churches? And so one of the things that Governor Deal has implemented in his tenure is thinking about stations of hope um, where churches are uh, actually have a label and are designated as places where they uh, individuals who are returning from, returning citizens should feel comfortable and welcome. They facilitate programming, and um, that is actually how I met Miss Osei because she works for she works at a um, works with a church who's a station of hope. Thank you for mentioning that. I guess there's a meeting Thursday or something. I can't remember. Oh, I can't remember which day or maybe it's tomorrow or something. I can't go. Or maybe it's like oh. I don't. Just yeah, I don't know right now. I can't even. I don't know. <laughs> Oh gosh, I'm sure you have um, all these questions. I know you were talking about even at the meeting at the ITC about ways that you can respond to uh, questions, or where did I see this? Maybe it was somewhere else. When an employer asks how you know about your criminal background or something like that. Um, so that's one thing that that makes Georgia different than some other places uh, in terms of what employers can ask and what has to be disclosed. Um, for example, in Georgia, um, you can't, most things can come off of your criminal record if you weren't convicted. Uh, basically the line is um, the only convictions that come off of someone's record are those um, m certain misdemeanors that are committed before the individual is 21 years or, uh, or younger. So we call those youthful offender, uh, uh, youthful offender record restriction. Other than that, um, all other convictions stay on your record. But let's say I get my criminal record expunged. I was arrested and I was acquitted. And I, you know, I went to trial and the jury found me not guilty. And I've gone through the process of having my record restricted or expunged under Georgia law. But then an employer asks me, have you ever been arrested? It puts someone in a very uncomfortable pos position in Georgia because in other places the law says very clearly that if you have a record expunged or restricted and an employer or housing provider or something asks you about it, then you can not disclose, you don't have to disclose to them the, the presence of this record. But Georgia law doesn't say that. And so the question becomes, where does that individual get that record from, the employer? Because if the employer pulls their record from the Georgia State Database, which is the Georgia Crime Information Center, then no record will show up. But if they use a private background check company that mined the court or the jail or the arresting agency for a record of the event years ago, and they report it to the employer and their employer, employer finds out about it, now I've lost the position. And I haven't lost the position because of the record, right? They will say that the reason why I lost the job is because I wasn't truthful. So it puts people in a very, um, in a catch-22 situation, which is what do, how do I answer this in light of me going through the process that the state has established for me to be able to move on? Um, so it's a challenge for individuals. And so what we, uh, what I would encourage someone to do in that situation is to tell them that they had been arrested. Yes, I've been arrested. However, my record was was restricted, and give them the date. And you know, and if they need more information, then you could provide it. But at least you could let them know. Yes, I've been arrested, but the state has expunged that record from my from my criminal history. Can you use the expression "moving on"? And in some of my conversations with people who've tried, in in many ways, it's as if they can never. You know, you're at the gas station and there's a robbery. You know, you always feel, I suppose, like you're going to be the, the most, uh, the, the one most likely to be hauled in. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I think, you know, I was, I was thinking about this campaign a little while ago about, um, you know, if you thought about it like a theft by shoplifting is a life sentence. Because even if you, if I'm convicted of shoplifting 20 years ago, but at, on every application I have to talk to talk about it, if I can't volunteer at my kid's school because of it, if I comes up for me and my job, then it is essentially a life sentence. And at what point do we think that someone should be able to move on from a theft by shoplifting or something like that? There's also data that suggests that the longer a, that an individual who has been um, uh, released or has moved on, if you will, after a criminal record, the longer period of time that that's been, the less likely they are to commit another crime. And that actually, at about 10 years, someone who has never been arrested 
is more likely to be arrested than someone who hasn't been arrested in 10 years, right? This notion about what it really means to turn a corner. So it's almost unfair to continue to hold that over someone's head after 10 years in light of the fact that what we know is that they are less likely to reoffend. What, with all that you do, and you, know, you talk about dealing with a death penalty issue, what gives you hope? Is there anything that in particular, or moments you've had where you go, yeah. I'm keep going. Yeah. Florist or I mean, yeah. So I think I'm a, I'm a, I'm a little bit too, maybe I'm too optimistic because I came out of uh, law school in 2008 and um, I started doing policy work here in 2000, or not at Southern Center, but in Georgia at, in 2009. And in 2010, Governor Deal runs for office and in 11, he, you know, sets out criminal justice reform as his Key, key issue of his administration. Um, and so in some ways I've been able to uh, ride the wave of fiscal conservatism, right? The economy plummeted and that, at that time. And so there were all this energy and attention around how can we save money? The intersection of you know, responsible, meaningful criminal justice reform that would allow people to lead productive, productive lives just seemed to be uh, make a lot more sense than it might have, you know, a few years before. Uh, so I think that that the fact that I've watched Georgia uh, go from one of the worst states in the country to being renowned as a leader in criminal justice reform is inspiring and makes me optimistic. I um, I'm trying to figure out how we continue this momentum, how we mobilize communities, and how we continue the conversation after this governor leaves office next year, and um, what kind of uh, good work might we be able to do in local communities now that we um, have some state leadership, uh, have had some late state leadership on this issue for, for the last several years. So I'm, I'm optimistic and hopeful. And here we are with and the camera. I mean, I'm kind of wondering what role the media can continue or can play an increased role mm -hmm. in helping to erase the stigma, help people understand what, you know, that possible life sentence for a <laughs> theft by shoplifting. Yeah. Um, you know, one of the, I think one of the hardest things to message about with this is the racial components to this, and it's because of the, the complexities of uh, the way the system has evolved. And so I think that the media has, is, it's, um, I'm sorry, I'm stumbling through yeah, this, yeah, but yeah, the risk assessment, no, no, no the, the, so we have this, this thing about risk assessment, um, a risk assessment tool, and I mention it because there is a way in which, instead of, in, we use it in bail, instead of money, right, saying to somebody, if you can pay me $200, you can get out of jail today that we should think about whether what kind of risk this individual poses to the community, and that should be our calculus instead of how much money they have. The problem is that that tool has baked in it the same racial disparities that we know exist. So if you ask questions like, how many times have you been arrested? You know, where, what zip code are you from? You know, were your parents incarcerated? Uh, you know, do, what, all, all, how far, um, at, how much education have you gotten? All those things that we know are more likely to be um, deficits in the African American community generally are more likely to, to, dim, to show up as risk, risky on this tool. And I say that to you to, in terms of the question you asked about the media for the same reason. Because if when these stories are being told, it's always a brown face or a black face, then the image that people see is that this is a black issue or a brown issue, and it must be that that's the way it's supposed to be, right? They, that, you know, they just must commit more crime. They, you know, these areas are just more concentrated with poverty. These are So I think that there is something some story that the media can tell about the intentionality of our criminal justice system, that this just didn't happen. And when you think about like this, the data we know about um, drug use and drugs and drug selling, that those are things that are more like more common and likely in white communities, yet the arrests are much more likely to occur in African American communities. So drawing on those kinds of distinctions, I think, would be helpful. I also think that there we have done ourselves somewhat of a disservice in criminal justice reform by focusing on nonviolent offenses um, because it, it presupposes that we don't have to do any work when it comes to violent crime. 
And I think that we, sh we should, right? We should be thinking about effective interventions for every person who touches our criminal justice system. And we shouldn't stop at it was a minor drug offense or it was just a property offense. We should be thinking about what are appropriate interventions throughout our whole system. So I'm asking folks to think about criminal justice reform in its, in its entirety and trying to figure out even if we can decide that there should be more punitive, a uh, more punitive system for certain crimes, that there should be um, a longer sentence and that we should think about a more rigorous curriculum of activities, that we should be thoughtful about the return, the likely return to our community and what we might be able to implement in, inside, inside of our prisons that would make individuals lead uh, you know, more peaceful lives. And the one other thing I'll say about that is when you talk about people who commit violent crime, the likelihood that they themselves were exposed to trauma or violent crime is astronomical. And so thinking about really what trauma, what role trauma is having on young communities right now, and that if we were really dealing with the way in which these young people were hurting and struggling with their everyday lives, we could turn things around in ways that would actually be more productive for us all. So it's, it's such a weird thing. And by the way, I want to be mindful of the time. What time, what time is it? Almost four. Almost four, OK. Um, you know, it's like prison reentry needs to start well before anyone's ever charged with a crime. Right. It's like, look, like you said, the circumstances that these kids are potentially growing up with, right. or, you know, any abuse in the home or it's out in the community. Right. Right. We just charge kids as adults. That's one thing that I think I told you came up. There's a bill now. Um, that seeks to try more children as adults age 13 and older. That doesn't help us. Putting kids in our adult system and sending them to adult prison at 17 years old does not help us. And if we need to be more, we need to be more thoughtful about how we respond to the 13 year old who has a gun or is with somebody who has a gun and that we are more intentional then, maybe he won't be the 25 year old who's been doing this for 15 years and have learned most of his, his tricks inside the prison with, with older guys, which is not the best way in which to bring about change. I cannot imagine a 13 year old well, they don't. Yeah, the thirteen-year-olds go to. They don't go into with the adults until older. But they get. They definitely are getting those twenty-year and fifteen and ten-year sentences right now. Interesting. Yeah. How do you prepare a kid for you know getting out? And, and I and I'm even thinking about some people getting out now who have not, you know, didn't grow up with cell phones and some of the technology that's just right. a, pro a part of you know right. life. I mean. Yeah. Right. Right. And think about choice. People say to me. Now these kids just aren't making the right choice. You know, this is about, you know, you take responsibility for your own actions. I didn't, I am a second generation. I, my kid, I, it's not really choice, right? The, this eight or nine year old who's walking by the 19 year old kid who has Jordans on his feet and the best clothes he's ever seen and the, you know, big shiny car. And he says, look, little man, you stand here give this box to this guy in this car when he drives by, I'll give you $200 and buy you some shoes like that. That eight-year-old kid looks down the street at that school that he knows what's going on in his school and what kinds of access to opportunity he has, thinking about the meal he didn't have that morning and the one he didn't have last night and the last time he might have seen his mom and that he doesn't know his dad. So he says, I can get 200 bucks today, right now. Well, that eight-year-old becomes a 10-year-old, becomes a 15-year-old, becomes a 17-year-old. And then we say to that 25-year-old or 30-year-old when he's coming out of prison, you've just made all of these wrong choices. I would say to you, that was not a choice. And that if any of us were in a very similar situation, many of us would have made the very same choice that that very young kid made when you think about what kinds of opportunities he may have had access to at that time. So if we were, you know, trying to make the school and the home more uh, encouraging for that eight-year-old or nine-year-old. If we thought about how shiny that car must look <laughs> to an eight-year-old kid and what we might need to do differently, I think we might not be where we are. Oh my gosh, I you know, was doing some work on sex trafficking over in the English Avenue area and was kind of hanging out there. with a friend of mine who was doing um, what they call it, harm reduction work. and, and 
I'll never forget kids come, coming off a school bus, you know, and kind of going down the street, and that house is all burned down, and you know, they know who the yeah. you know sellers are and the you know, sex workers, etc. And I really do think about that. That's right. You know, they don't That's have right. a vision of anything. Yeah. Sometimes starving. You know, I've had these stories about kids who are just putting their mouth under the faucet and filling it up with water so they can sleep. It's just. It, no, this I mean, is all about poverty. I'm like talking about today. Uh, th this is today. This is right now. That that there are kids, you know. You think about winter break. My kid, my son's on winter break right now, and school being out for a couple of weeks. Some kids only eat because they go to school, and these are the kids who are more likely to be in our criminal justice system, and so they need more than most other kids do. And unless we're going going to really invest in our communities in ways that give that kid who's not eating the same kinds of opportunities for success as the kid who has both parents and is able to play and you know soccer on the weekends then we're not we're not setting up a system of fairness and it's you know i am committed and southern center is committed to seeing a georgia and an atlanta in the way that we want to which is that every kid has access to lead the same kind of life and that people who are returning from prison have act the ability to not return, and we are intentional and serious about making sure that people are successful in that endeavor. And, and one thing that you know, this gentleman we mentioned earlier, Lachie Ruffin, is doing is teaching entrepreneurship classes. Yes. I understand, and that's you know when you think about being discriminated against in terms of job opportunities, why not find ways to start your own? I think that's right. I think that's right. I I would say that that's true. But it's definitely, we still need to be intentional about changing the employers too. But yes, you know, uh, access to license and certification and starting your own business are definitely things um, that are available opportunities for formerly incarcerated people. Just shouldn't be that hard. Shouldn't have to be that hard. And I remember him saying to me something about, and maybe this, he talks about this all the time, that his reentry program started when the judge banged the gavel. Right. You know, it wasn't like just the week before or the year before. Right. Right. At, right, that's right. I would say, you know, to the point you make about, um, I'd say reentry starts at arrest. You know, this the concept of once you have a record, how how can you get a job? How can you, even if you never went, even if you were never convicted? I had a client that didn't have anything on his record. He got charged with eleven felonies. Went all the way to trial, including murder. Went all the way to trial. Was found not guilty. And that record showed up for him in housing applications. And then, you know, so you don't even have to be convicted to have to re-enter society with a record.